Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Spartan Forge. On today's episode, I am joined by my dad, Joe Martonic. My dad is well known locally for consistently killing mature bucks every single year with a bow on public land in Pennsylvania. This year he shot a absolute once in a lifetime mountain buck after six years of history with the buck and over 21 days of continually hunting for him this season alone. So we discussed finding this deer years ago, back to 2016, attempting to find his core area, adapting in the middle of the season, still hunting him from the ground, staying mobile, and then the setup for the final encounter. This episode is brought to you by Spartan Forge, and the Spartan Forge app utilizes years of military background in machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement, including GPS data, 30 years of weather, academic, and state research. The new app includes GPS mapping with incredible aerial imagery, offline dependability, deer prediction, weather updates, journal entries, and much more. You can now use the code EASTMEETSWEST to save 20% off of the Spartan Forge app at spartanforge.ai. Tethered is a company that is founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative, lightweight, safe products for saddle hunting, like their brand new Skeletor climbing sticks. These are a follow-up to the one sticks that released last year. These are not a replacement, but they're a more budget-friendly version of the one sticks. And these are have a bunch of features into it, including a dual step design that folds away from the tree, gives you much more room for your feet when you're climbing. They still use the patented Dynalite rope and tab. It's very lightweight and a fast connection method, and there are just no heavy buckles that are that are involved in it at all. So there's no fiddle factor involved, and at only two pounds per stick, they're still very lightweight. And come in at a lot better price point than what you'd found, you know, with the one sticks as they are just expensive to make and tough to make. So the Skeletors come in at 225 for a four pack. You can't buy singles. You buy them in a four pack ready to hunt. So check those out at tetherednation.com. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct-to-consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. Their products are back with a lifetime no-fault warranty and an incredible customer experience. The RS2 ultralight rifle scope was designed for the all-purpose hunter and features a 2 to 10 times zoom range to cover most eastern and western hunting situations. The RS2 is my recommended scope for those who require precision but don't need the added features of a long-range scope, thus making it perfect for small game, eastern whitetail, as as well as western big game like I did um, in my caribou hunt in Alaska. But it's really good for those ultralight mountain rifle setups with the scope coming in at only 12 ounces. It's one of the lightest all-purpose scopes on the market. You can use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST-GIF for a free gift with any full price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. Go Wild is a free social community built by hunters for hunters. Join me on Go Wild today to get 10 bucks spent on gear for just setting up your account. You'll keep unlocking Go Wild rewards, and you can now see my complete gear setups over under my account, which is just under my name, Bo Martonic. Join at time to go wild.com or at the app store of whether that's Apple or Google Play. Find it there and use the code East Meets West to save 10% off of all hunting gear on the website, which includes tethered saddle products. So this episode has been one that that I've been really looking forward to releasing and actually just record it with my dad. So just we recorded this episode here um, on Sunday and went over to his house to record it. 
and you know with the podcast this week and then there'll be an article that follows this as well over at free range american which is black rifle coffees um outdoor uh news spot so it's a an online blog there that you can find a whole bunch of information there so i'll write the story um about this hunt with my dad uh over there so you can find that at freerangeamerican.us and also i got some new stuff over in the online store got the the new woodsman beanies that are available i've never done beanies before um because i haven't really found the right one that that i wanted to do or right ones but uh, so I, I talked with legacy who's make some of our hats um already and legacy's out of pennsylvania they do really good quality work and i found a hat a beanie that i really wanted to do and i put the adventure compass logo um with a leather patch on the front of it you got two different colors there's brown marled and a gray black marled and they turned out awesome i think i made a mistake in how many i ordered because these turned out way better than than i could have expected and they're a nice mid-weight beanie to be able to put on they have good stretch you can layer over uh, a lightweight you know merino or synthetic beanie if you want for colder situations um, but honestly it doesn't matter if you're cutting firewood if you're sitting in a tree stand or ice fishing with some buddies this will this will definitely fit in your cold weather arsenal so check that out eastmeetswesthunt.com slash shop you can find all the stuff donate three percent of sales have done this since day one to a conservation organization of the quarter and this quarter quarter four is the national deer association so i'll be donating three percent of sales over to those guys and i think what they're doing is great so i'll be doing that and i uh, hope everyone checks it out i really appreciate the support with the apparel sales been great here recently that helps with the podcast a ton and also those coupon codes that i mentioned in the in the beginning with the, the partners of the podcast those help out a lot with with many of those i do make a small commission off of that and that's what helps you keep this show rolling so again greatly appreciate all the support and i really hope you enjoy this episode with my dad as much as i did getting to talk to him about it have a great week all right we're live dad welcome back to the the podcast good to be back bo yeah it's yeah i think the last one you were with johnny was it down here in the yeah probably about the same same time frame as after you shot your uh, rifle buck yeah, yeah, it was. It was December of last year, I believe, and uh, I, yeah, it was right here at, in your basement. Johnny Johnny Stewart was down here with us, and he always makes it pretty entertaining. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what what do you got? What do you got in your glass there? You got the High West uh, whiskey. I mi- mixed you up a, a my own old fashioned. Yeah, you did. It, it tastes pretty good. It, it's not not a real old fashioned because it's I don't use the the sugar water or real really it's basically just bitters and whiskey but <laughs> it tastes all right and then you got what else you got over there oh I brought some Rainier back from uh, Montana Rainier beer you'd said that was on what TV Long, show? Longmire drinks it <laughs> on Netflix and. I don't know if anybody's ever watched that show, but it's it's a pretty good one on on Netflix there. But um, so yeah, so we're sitting down here, and you just got back from Montana and got came back with a a buck from there, and then obviously most of the story we're talking about here from Pennsylvania. But it's been a pretty good month. Been a real good month. Um, just an unbelievable month. Actually, I first couple of weeks I was waiting to wake up find out it was a dream <laughs> lately i've been having nightmares that i did wake up and it didn't happen <laughs> <laughs> but then you you come down here and you see him sitting on the, the yep, bar so yep that's that's the solid reminder <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was uh definitely a, a long road to to get into this well the the pennsylvania buck specifically i mean that was that was a uh, definitely a long time coming 
Yeah, I've been uh, I've been after him uh, probably actively probably in seventeens when I started actively searching for him. Um, going back through trail cam histories, I did film him in sixteen. Uh, he was a ten, uh, a nine, but uh, could have been a. I think he has been a scorable ten, but uh, wasn't nothing that caught my eye then. Uh, but in seventeen, uh, he was a real, really nice. 10 point that I'd say pushing into 140, mid 140s probably, um, that, uh, definitely caught my eye. Um, caught him during the summer on McCam and, uh, only caught him one time and or fall off. I, I searched for him with additional cameras, putting them on scrapes, uh, trails, and I could never find him. Um, and that's kind of been the story up until this year. Well, what, what, you mean, and you ran a lot of cameras in the surrounding area, like from where you picked them up in the summertime and other places around there. Am I right? I mean, you oh, hunted yeah. that area quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and it's, 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 I'm no stranger to that area. Um, I, I hunt a lot of the scrapes in those areas. I run cameras, uh, year round on scrapes in those areas. Um, but this one, would I I couldn't figure out where he was coming from, and uh, you know I was reaching out up to a couple miles from the summer area with cameras uh, in hopes of picking them up and, and uh, constantly expanding, and uh, where I ended up finding them this year was in between everything. It was actually ended up being a probably about a oh a little over a mile from his uh, summer range. Um, that uh, it was more of a on top where I was, I did run some cameras on top, but, uh, most of my scrapes are crick bottom scrapes. And that's kind of where I was searching for them throughout the years. Well, and, and it was, I mean, it wasn't even when you say, um, you were running cameras, you know, in the bottoms, but you were also running a lot of cameras on those tops, but he was, he ended up being ridges away. You know, he wasn't like just in, on top, like where you had gotten him in the summertime there. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he actually, it was a small clear cut that uh, I kind of overlooked, um, mainly because I know it gets a lot of hunting pressure during the rifle season, and I just would always try to avoid it. And, uh, I, you know, just this year, you know, I did pick him up hard horned in, uh, I believe it was September 7th. And that was the first time I ever got him hard horned on camera. And, uh, I just, you know, I, well, I dedicated 12 cameras to it this year. And I actually picked up a, uh, an Exodus cell cam, uh, to complement my cameras in hopes to, you know, help me find them and, and get, get the, the information I needed to hunt them. Well, let's, let's go back before you get too far into, this year and first of all i did i did a bad job with uh the introduction so your name's not just my dad joe martonic and and he, so he's been if you haven't listened to before he's been on some other episodes you can get a little bit more of the 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 background um on him here but before before we go into the the full story as far as this year specifically explain a little bit like your scouting kind of routine with looking for this year really whatever because you you spend uh a crazy amount of time in the spring and the winter and stuff shed hunting and and scouting and looking so like when you're saying you're searching for them you know with cameras there was a lot of boots on the ground from that standpoint too yeah the camera is actually just a small part of it um uh i i, I it's pretty much a 365 uh scout for me um uh, let alone hunt but um in the spring I'm, I'm i'm shed hunting i'm looking for his sheds and other sheds i'm looking at the sign uh, marking scrapes uh, marking trails and marking rubs and uh those are all logged and uh then come, uh, you know, probably after spring gobbler, when, you know, most people start getting out of the woods again, I start throwing the cameras on the scrapes, the rubs, the trails, um, and trying to find them, um, you know, for, in, in particular for this buck. But I, I, I pretty much do that for any deer I'm, I'm trying to hunt or, or have my target on as far as uh, hopefully killing in, in the fall. 
Yeah, but your your spring your spring scouting when you're going to look for them. If you ever look at the map, so if if you were to open up your Spartan Forge account and look at the the tracks that go back and forth, it's uh, it's it looks like the entire area is covered. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably have more tracks than topo lines. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> when you, when you're when you're shed hunting, you're doing a lot of gridding and stuff yeah. and going back and trying to learn every square inch of the area. From what I've learned. Yeah, yep, definitely. And uh I mean it's it's good and bad. It, you can be really thorough for an area, but if he's not in there then you're you know, it, it, you you kind of there's only so much time in the spring. Yeah. And uh so there's some areas that I don't get to. Um maybe other every other year I I would try, you know, looking for his sheds in some of the other areas that I had uh plotted on the map where I thought maybe he might be. Um, you know, from some of the other history of bucks that we've uh, hunted in the past, um, some have gotten killed six and a half miles from where we filmed them. Yeah. So, you know, being I was only filming this guy once or twice in the summer, um, I didn't, I had no idea where he was coming from. I was afraid that he might be one of them four or five mile bucks that was just passing through. So when I didn't pick him up, and then I mean I still was hunting in that area uh, amongst some other some other areas, but uh, I mean he was always in the back of my mind. Um, and uh, then when I would shed hunt and and move into new area shed hunting, trying to find his sheds and come up empty, it was it was, it was pretty frustrating. And then I would always think, well, he must have got harvested, you know, that that prior hunting season. And then lo and behold. Show back late, up. <laughs> late June or uh, usually it was late June or early July. I'd get them once, maybe twice, and that was enough to uh, make me go crazy again for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to see if if that deer had a GPS tracker, like the the Penn State deer studies that we've you know watched and seen how you know some of those deer have certain times where they just kind of like go off and right. you know whether that was actually a summer range or if there was just like you know a week out of the summer or so or that he would go to that area i don't know what do you what do you think yeah i mean he he definitely was passing through um and being i you know where i ended up finding him was uh you know a little better than a mile um yeah i i think he you know i don't know where else he went i i do know a lot of places where he never did go from my cameras <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean throughout the years so i mean and that kind of helped me i guess because um I still ran cameras on some of my other scrapes, but I um, really wasn't expecting much. So I definitely would reach out further with additional cameras. And uh, and uh, I moved them more this fall, too. Um, if I didn't pick them up, you know, I had a, that one clear cut. I think it was in uh, early October. I remember telling you it was on a Sunday. I was doing some scouting for him, and I jumped a huge buck in a clear cut. Mm -hmm. And I told you it could very well be him, but I could not positively identify it that it was i was only i was within 20 25 yards of him when he popped up but it was just so thick all he seen was a flash of antlers and the long tines um was it him i can't say for sure i believed it was though and i um uh, actually that's when i purchased my first cell camera i put it in that clear cut and had two additional uh cameras uh actually three additional cameras surrounding that clear cut on trails going in and out and uh Three weeks went by. It was, well, it was like, I think it was around the 17th of October, somewhere around there, uh, when I um, still hunted it and uh, came up empty and decided that uh, it's time to move the cell camera to another clear cut, which I've been in before. I uh, headed over that area, did some scouting. Well, um, did you Did you get any other bucks on those? like coming in like using that like bedding did you, like did you have when you said you had your cameras there were they focused on trails in and out of that specific bed or just like the cut that he was in uh coming in and out of the bedding area i mean i, I believe he bedded where where i had jumped them there was uh, uh some large beech trees mature beech trees mm -hmm. that were dropping and i think he was just bedding by the food um uh it's actually the same clear cut i had killed a buck in 2015 on the first day, opening day still hunting the clear cut and it was probably within 60 80 yards so i don't know if it was just a, a you know right terrain feature for them that you know it's a little bench there with in this clear cut that uh, they liked um and the clear cut had grown up but they had gone through and trimmed 
took the saplings, the 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 trees they didn't want out, uh, probably about three years ago. Actually, it was right after. Yeah, it's probably night. No, in maybe in seventeen, they cut all the the junk trees, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, to get the, what trees they want to, to keep on uh, growing. So it kind of made it another new clear cut at that time. Um, but it, it uh, how old do you think that cut was like originally? It was like an older 10 plus year I'm old thinking, cut. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe 2007, 2009, yeah. somewhere around that time frame. Yeah. I'm not sure if there's any data on that or not that, uh, would tell me that Hmm. but um but yeah i had him on the trails where i thought he was bedding in and out of that you know his entrance and exits um and i never picked a deer up in that three weeks not a single deer (laughs) now the other two well i did leave one camera throughout the season and uh it was early november i picked up a nice tent that would uh would definitely be one I would have harvested it if if it would have or tried to harvest it anyways if he would have walked by me instead of this buck and uh yeah he was a, he was a definitely a shooter um and I picked him up I think it was two days in a row daylight and uh there was two other smaller bucks that same week um or within the same couple of days I think there was just a, uh they were you know hot dough in the area or whatever it may have been but other than that, um, you know, I pulled the camera the day after I shot this buck, and there was no additional photos on it. Did have some bear movement through the clear cut. Mm-hmm. But then you you had so you had moved the cameras from that cut to another area. You mm-hmm. were saying so when when you went to to move those, that was after not having any pictures, you know, for three weeks, like you were saying. But was the area you were moving them to? Did you have any? Intel that made you think that you wanted to move to this area, or what? What was your kind of thought process? Well, I had shed under this uh, these other clear cuts. There's there, um, there's probably I don't know maybe four or five of them, and uh, they're they're broken up into small cuts, uh, maybe five hundred square yards um, each of them. Um, and I've shed hunted it for his sheds in the past, suspecting he could be in there, and always came up empty. I did run a camera in there probably three years ago, came up empty on, on some scrapes. Um, you know, and every year I try to purchase a couple of additional cameras. So I've been building up my, my cameras uh, to where this year I was able to throw a lot more uh, at it, you know, yeah. to that area. And um, I just, um, I you know, and, and I, as I said before, it, it is an area that's heavily hunted in rifle season. Uh, I think it starts in bear season. They drive them clear cuts. Yeah. And then, um, then rifle, um, um, there, there's a lot of deer hunters there, you know, in that area. Archery, um, I only found one other camera and one other stand the whole time I was in there. But, um, yeah, I decided to revisit it and, and I, I've, I've done that pretty much every year, but I found enough sign this year in particular, I found one scrape that was just tore tore all to hell and it was probably you know an eight foot by eight foot scrape it was just i I haven't seen a scrape like that in a long time with that much activity just from you know how dug up it was uh so that's when i where i threw my cell camera up and i think it was that was on the 21st i believe and then on the 23rd i was hunting out of service and uh, I got back home, ate supper, and I think I even took a shower before I even started looking at photos. I seen I had some new photos uh, uh, from Scout Tech, and uh, and lo and behold, he was there at 6.43 p.m., which in hindsight, if I would have been sitting there, I think it was still light enough to shoot per the, the, the uh, yeah, that was still shooting, legal shooting yeah, light. Yeah, still legal that. shooting light. In fact, I remember your t- your text back to me was why weren't you there <laughs> <laughs> so then uh what the, if you remember what we did the next morning yeah i i helped had you help me haul in a, a hang on heavy sticks and heavy platform uh because that's pretty much all i had left in the barn to, to put out <laughs> yeah and yeah and and we were um because i was asking i said when you first found a scraping like, why didn't you just jump up in your saddle well the problem was it was just so it was 
it was tough to it was it was kind of crazy thick there and just a bunch of limbs you would had to do a lot of cutting with it so we were like but you knew you were going to hunt this a bunch of times and you wanted to be able to slip in quietly so we were like right. let's let's go in and hang a put a hang on stand in there that you could you could get into and actually you were you were still pretty green to the saddle at that point. Yeah. You I, hadn't I, even hunted out of it much. Yeah, I think I, I had maybe three sits up until then. Yeah. And so I was still a little leery as far as um, an all-day set. Cause yeah. I hadn't done an all-day set yet. Um, where, um, you know, prior to this year, my my go-to stands were my climber and, and the hang-ons, the lock-ons. Um, so yeah, I, I just felt more comfortable that if I'm going to do pull an all day sit in the future, that, um, that's where I wanted to be in since, uh, that was my comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you were a little bit leaning on it, which actually it, it worked out okay from, from that standpoint, we got that stand in there and we made a little bit more noise than we wanted to hanging it up. Yeah. 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 It was, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, looking at the weather, um, that Wednesday coming up had a, a little bit of a cold front. The barometric pressure was rising. Um, looked like a real good day. I actually took a couple hours off of work in that, that morning to hunt it. And, uh, and that was the first, I, I remember that day. It was the first, um, was it full? Yeah, I think it was full range day that it was showing on the Spartan Forge app, right, which yep. lined up with a lot of those different weather conditions as well. But it was the first full range day out of a lot of there before that were core area. So I mean, it wasn't, you know, a mm-hmm. whole lot of movement going on at that point, but, um, that was the first, first day of that. Right. Yep. And, um, uh, well, I remember walking in in the morning, uh, you know, still dark and I was only actually I was probably within 80 yards of the stand, and I, I jumped the heavy hoof deer. I had my red light on, um, and it actually crossed the path in front of me, big bodied, but I couldn't tell if it was him. Uh, I'm assuming it was a buck uh, based off the size of the body. Um, and uh, I thought, well, I just screwed that up. But uh, I did, you know, I sat till probably 9, 9.30, got out, had to get into work. And then I had planned on coming back that afternoon, um, trying to slip out of work a little early if I could. And uh, didn't get out as early as I wanted to, but it, I did manage to, to get out a little bit early. And when I was walking in, I got to within uh, probably 200 yards of my stand, and um, I had jumped a yearling uh, doe. And just backing up, when I, you know, when I did get him on, uh, the camera, the 23rd, they're at 6.43 p.m. Also during that day, earlier that day, around 4, there was a, a, a mother and a, a, a yearling at the scrape and had multiple pictures of her. She was, you know, the mom was hitting the scrape, so figured she, you know, probably was a hot doe. Um, so right away when I seen that yearling, I'm thinking, okay, where's mama at? Is, is she being chased? Are they nearby? Are they close? So I immediately knocked an arrow, got my release on, and uh, started grunting. And uh, within minutes, he appeared. Um, at a, I estimated 50 yards. I went to full draw. He was standing broadside, uh, um, looking look at my way. Then he looked to, in the direction of the doe. Um, I could not see his vitals. They were covered by a, a, a tree. I could see his head, his rack. And then I could see his guts. I'm at full draw. At, I'm figuring 50 yards. And uh, elected not to shoot. Um, uh, I waited for him to try to step out. Then I ended up letting down after probably, it seemed like a couple of minutes, but it might have you know, been 30 seconds for, or whatever it was. And I wanted to grunt some more. So I grunted a few more times. And then he took off in the direction of the, uh, of the doe. Um so then I slipped into the stand, debated on what to do. It was a little too noisy to try to go after him, I think, uh, as far as the... On the ground. Yeah, to, um, to try to follow and, 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 and ground him up. Um, so I slipped into the stand. I didn't see anything uh, that the rest of that sit. Um, but then at, uh, it was like 9, 9.30, 9.40 that evening, my cell camera sends me a photo and there he is in front of the scrape 
<laughs> so um, I definitely didn't. He, but it, he, it was October 25th? Uh, or that no, even later than that, twenty seventh, twenty eighth. Yeah, something like that. I can't, I can't remember exactly what date. Uh, you have all your notes there, but yeah, yeah. I knew it was sometime there, not long after twenty seventh. It was 27th. Wednesday the twenty seventh. Yeah, okay. But um, yeah, so then that's like now. Then I started, you know, what could I have done differently when I grunted? Mm -hmm. You know, should I have? Uh, bleated instead or you know all these different things that go through your mind and uh but you know that was water under the bridge now and you had to move on um at that point in time oh i i didn't have a good win for that stand that stand in particular i needed a uh northwest was be or north was best northwest or a west wind would work for that stand um but you know the following days um weren't ideal winds i think there were southwest winds a lot of southwest winds i believe were following that 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 particular day so i had to try to find some additional stand sites um did hit the grounds a couple different evenings after work uh scouting and hunting uh found some uh, more additional scrapes that i threw some cameras on um uh, the one in particular i actually climbed a tree with the saddle it was um completely on the opposite end of this clear cut uh, probably about 500 yards from my cell cam and uh, i remembered uh, i actually forgot i had a camera in my pack and uh, i actually hung it while i was sitting in the saddle right in front of me the bad thing was every time i needed to check it i needed two sticks to to, to be able to reach it <laughs> oh i didn't, I didn't realize I didn't, I didn't think that went through too much <laughs> and so you were only hunting two sticks high at that yeah spot? yeah but uh <laughs> yeah no actually i was three sticks but two sticks i could reach up and grab the <laughs> get the camera but um so that was kind of a pain <laughs> um but um uh and actually that camera gave me a lot of intel um i picked him up on that camera probably three different days uh november 2nd 3rd and the 6th but they were all middle of the night 2 a.m you know 11 p.m and midnight uh then uh, i had it and, and and by now i had uh probably a total of 12 cameras within a i guess a square mile area that 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 uh that clear cut some were there from before uh, a lot of them were new ones um, and out of them 12 cameras there was only three cameras I was picking them up on and after plotting it on the uh, the, Sp the Spartan Forge app um, the, the waypoints it was um, obvious that his core area was very a lot smaller than I anticipated he was down to about a 500 square yard area just one of those clear cuts it was the only uh, ones I was picking them up on or uh, of those, you know, those those multiple clear cuts. It was just yeah. one that he was regularly in, and uh, and so how how many cameras were there that you had picked him up, or how many days? I, I can't remember, but it was, a, you know, I can't remember. It was like around November the tenth or so when, when you were looking back and you log everything as far as mm -hmm. like the photos. If you saw your notebooks and your <laughs> spreadsheets and everything but you had it down to he was there almost every single day on one of those cameras those three cameras. yeah out of those three cameras he was on one of them seven out of the nine day, first days of november that's day and night mostly. yeah yeah day day. well it was, it was yeah there was only there was no there was actually no daylight photos of those seven mm -hmm. um now prior to you know getting back to the 23rd was uh the only daylight that I had. Now, in hindsight, um, when I was pulling my cameras after uh, the next day, I did have him daylight on a, an additional camera that I never had him on before outside of that triangle. Uh, it was probably another four or 500 yards outside, uh, but uh, I had him on Veterans Day at uh, uh, 4.59 p.m. Okay. Um, which I'm kind of glad I didn't check it on yeah. the 12th or the 13th because that may have swayed where i sat on the 14th yeah yeah <laughs> but so and and when you were um moving around these different areas but like you hunted that one stand that fixed stand we set pretty 
quite a bit, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, but I also, uh, I, I probably, well, I still hunted that whole area, not just that clear cut, but uh, the outreaches uh, probably at least four, maybe five times. And uh, and then I was in the saddle around that clear cut another probably six times, seven times, uh, maybe different, more. Different trees? Uh Four different trees, yeah. Okay. But the, but the, uh, two of them, well, at the end there, and uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but uh, uh, I guess just backing up, um, my first, my second, okay, my my first daylight encounter was when I was going in on there on the, uh, what was that, the 27th. Yep. Um, did a lot of sits, um, coming up empty, seeing some deer, passing up some deer. Actually, um uh, what day was it when I shot the coyote? That would have been on the, uh, November 1st, maybe? That was something like... Yeah, November, November 1st, I was sitting in that, that hang on that we had hung, and, uh, it was, uh, I had a good feeling about that morning, and <laughs> it was a little after, uh, well, a little bit before 8, I see a, a, a a doe running out at about 50 60 yards and um first she's getting chased and started grunting right away and uh, all of a sudden a coyote pops out of, right onto the scrape that i'm sitting over and um well i'm not going to pass that opportunity up <laughs> <laughs> so i sunk an arrow in him and um he just spun around was flopping around right there and then all of a sudden, another coyote pops out right behind him. And right to my left, right below me, there was a third coyote. So now I'm trying to reload, <laughs> pulling the arrows out of the quiver, in which my follow-up arrow is usually an expandable um, for further distance, anticipating a further distance shot if I needed a follow-up. And the blade came open. So then I had trouble with putting that, trying to get that situated and I'm grabbing another fixed blade. And by then... I couldn't get a shot at the other two. Um, so I waited a little bit, and I ended up climbing down, and um, I retrieved the coyote. And uh, I walked behind a scrape uh, through the brush, and uh, in, in my exit path, basically. I stayed off of the uh, the deer trails with it, but hit it by a log about 80 yards from the stand so I could retrieve it on my way out that evening. And then uh, I think it was around 1 p.m., uh, a little bit before 1, um, I heard another crash, and then here comes a doe through. I start grunting, and uh, and there was a decent, I, I don't know if he was an 8 or 10. There was two of them that were kind of wide but short-tined in there. And uh, I, pulled her, I pulled him off of her, and he actually came over. It was coming right to me. But then when he hit where I shot the coyote, he stopped dead, put his nose to the ground, and it was just, you know, he, he wasn't coming any further. He, he smelled that blood. Um, and I remembered I sent you the video because at that point in time, I decided that he wasn't, you know, wasn't one I was going to take. Uh, although I've shot in smaller and been very happy. <laughs> but being I was after this particular buck, I elected to pass. And uh, But I, I sent you the video, and <laughs> your only comment was, Dad, you're really shaking or something. Yeah, I said, I said, I said, you got I said, you got to get it together. I said, if you're shaking that bad with that buck, <laughs> you got to hold it together when the, the big one comes in. But it was funny because you're holding your phone next to your bow and I could hear your arrow rattling on. The, yeah. yeah on well, you could see the tip. Yeah. You could see it moving you back see the tip just, just <laughs> vibrating. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and I mean, and the best part of it, I already, at that, I already decided I wasn't going to shoot it. Usually I calm down, but, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it was. Well, yeah, the, the adrenaline was was really flown because I really, when I heard that chase and that crash, and I, I was hoping it was going to be, you know, stickers popping out instead of him. But uh, so, the, the adrenaline was definitely flowing. Yeah, well, yeah, and and two, I mean, you really hadn't. I mean, we're talking about the deer you've seen, but you spent a lot of days of not seeing any deer mm -hmm. and anything. So that was, and a lot of. Uh, nights of you and I talking back and forth and 
me trying to convince you to only shoot stickers. Yeah. And you trying to fight me on it. So Well, <laughs> well the, the, the worst part of it was you had your mother behind you. Yep. So I got it from you when you were around or when I was talking to you, but I got it 24-7 from your mother. Yeah, at home. <laughs> <laughs> at home. So uh, and, and she simplifies it in a way that can almost make you mad because you're yeah. like, she's just like, oh, it's it's uh just just shoot that one. That's the only one you're gonna shoot. And you're like, well, yeah, that would be nice, but <laughs> yeah, yeah she, yeah, she can definitely simplify things. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was it was funny. But in hindsight, if it wasn't for you and her pushing me to hold out, um. You know, I, I probably would have taken something that <laughs> earlier um, that I had opportunities at. Um, but every time uh, something would come in that I probably would normally shoot, uh, either your voice or her voice was in my head saying, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just felt like you knew you've. And it, it wasn't like you just had pictures of him during the summertime. Once you kind of started honing in and everything, it became more real that it was very, very possible. Well, yeah, and, and all joking aside, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I this was the year of, of any of them that I felt I had a chance at them. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it does, uh, it wears on you, but you do need that support. You need that, you know, somebody saying, hey you know, it's going to happen, you know, just that reinforcement. Cause, uh, well, you know how it is. You're sitting in that tree all day or several days and don't see nothing. And you start second guessing your whole setup. You're thinking maybe he moved on, maybe, uh, you know, this or that, you know, and, and like, you know, we're talking about me having him on camera seven out of nine days. Why well, wasn't getting that Intel on an hourly basis? I only had one cell camera. Yeah. And, and on that cell camera, I picked him up, uh, three different times. And it was only one of those was uh, in no that November time frame, the, the 5th. The other two was the 27th and the, the 23rd. So that information, you know, didn't come. Uh, it wasn't as straightforward as, as no, it's not it as, Right. Yeah, it's not as straightforward as I'm making it sound now. I think it was actually on the 9th or 10th. I'm not sure which, which one would have been a Sunday, probably when I pulled all the camera cards and then started putting all that together and realized – that he was there, I just he's just being nocturnal. Yeah, and uh, and I think I even told you I says I I believe he probably was close to me at different times, but just smelled me, and I just never seen him. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know I my experience is a a, a a a mature buck. If he smells you, he usually doesn't blow. He just sneaks off and heads the other way mm -hmm. uh, without you know I. I without you seeing them and you won't even raise their tail. Um, but, uh, so I'm, I, I truly believe that he knew I was there without a doubt, um, which made all the more reason for me to, you know, have multiple stand sites, um, within that 500 square yard area, basically. Um, now moving forward, I guess, um, you know, I, I, I did do, like I said, I did do some still hunting. Uh, so explain, for him. explain how, how you were still hunting. Cause that's, I think that's an interesting concept for, for people that always, you know, if you're worried about, you know, spooking deer or, or doing anything about pushing the envelope, but you kind of do it where you're being really aggressive, but in a calculated way, you know, it's not just recklessly going into a place. Yeah. Well, first you got to play the wind. Um, so depending on how the wind is blowing is how you enter that clear cut. Um, uh, secondly, you don't want to just, uh, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you can't get an arrow out. If he comes in, you, you know, you don't want to be grunting where there's no physical way you could shoot. Um, so you got to kind of try to pick little openings in that clear cut as you're, as you're going through before you grunt and, and, and know what your limitations are going to be, how close he's going to have to be for you to get a, an ethical shot on them. Um, so, and you're moving, and when you're moving, when you're still hunting, you're moving really slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know, for me to go from one end of that clear cut to the other, you know, five hundred yards, you might be talking three and a half, four hours. Yeah. Um. Uh. But yeah, it's it's not a yeah. I and, and I guess. 
when I started getting into steel hunting, you know, back 20 some years ago or whenever it was, um, it was mainly because I'd get bored in a tree and I'm thinking, you know, I need to be on the ground, but I made a lot of mistakes early on, moving too fast, uh, just blowing stuff out. So, you know, I learned that you just got to creep along, read some articles about it. And, uh, um, yeah, you, 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 it's, it's not, you know, can't treat it as a, a, uh, you know, you're not putting a deer drive on, you're, you're hunting, you know, treat it as if you're sitting in a tree, but you're maybe moving a few feet every, you know, minute or so. Yeah. Uh, so yeah so but but in that in that regard you're able to hunt and still be efficient with you always have an arrow knocked and release clip or not release clip but because you use a uh a trigger release but you always have an arrow knocked as you're going through and you're always ready so yeah. you, you're able to scout plus hunt at the same time yeah exactly and um yeah and you're right as far as having an arrow knocked in uh my release clip because um i've i've made the mistake of not being clipped on my release and grunted bucks in and i cannot physically clip on my release <laughs> needless to say those deer one of them was within five six yards of me standing just standing or staring at me and i couldn't do it <laughs> finally when he was about 40 yards heading the other way i was able to clip on but too late too late <laughs> so i'm i'm always i always try to be ready i um yeah there's just well if i didn't get excited i wouldn't be out there <laughs> yeah yeah it's a, it's a rush yeah and and so you had been you know moving along and like when you're talking about these cameras you had all these pictures on that was constantly you were checking them quite a bit and you were moving around and and, and a lot of times i know we we were talking about you were looking for does that yes. were more than anything you were focusing on on does and and then when you'd see just yearlings on there you you know could reasonably assume that the mother was getting chased or locked down with one yeah yeah and i had um uh, one occasion i came across a mature doe and um and the yearling i i actually seen maybe a uh, hundred yards from her but when i grunted i seen that i watched the mature doe for a while and uh, glassed trying to see if there was a buck bed near her. She was just standing there, and I didn't see, I couldn't find one. Um, so then I decided to grunt and see if that would, that would stir anything up. And after I grunted, the doe just bedded down and made herself very small, uh, low to the ground, actually laid her head down. And huh. uh, no, no buck appeared. Um, and after maybe another... 20 minutes of watching her occasionally grunting i decided to make a move and, and and started moving on and that's when i ran into the yearling about you know almost 100 yards from her uh, but uh so i'm not sure i mean she had obviously ditched the, whichever buck was harassing her at that time but uh um but yeah it's it's uh, you know when i'm still hunting I'm, I'm 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 hunting but i'm scouting um i usually have a try to have a camera or two in my pack that if i find some good sign that i want to uh monitor then i'll throw the camera up on it yeah and then um so it, okay so as you were kind of moving along and you're you know bouncing around with the saddle at that point because you so other than that fixed stand you were hunting out of your saddle or on the ground the whole time yes yeah yep that was the only fixed stand i had in there so yeah you got you got pretty used to your saddle in a short period of time kind of yeah i started getting comfortable with it and um yeah i mean i had uh i probably i don't know you know you know, I, I'm not sure how many sits. I don't. I didn't record that, but I had uh, grinded in uh, probably three or four different bucks while I was in the saddle, and mm -hmm. um, passed on a couple of them. Um, but uh, I started getting pretty efficient. I, you know, I could uh, climb in as long as I remember to tie my bow on the string, I didn't have to go back down. Yeah. <laughs> I've done, did that before. I was pretty proud of myself. I'd get everything up there without having to, you know, go back down for a stick or the platform and then go to pull my bow up and it's not tied on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but there in the end, I was, uh, 
Yeah, I was I was getting pretty proficient at it. Are you sold on it? You think that you'll do it more? I think so. I mean, that's not going to be my only go-to stand. Yeah. There's still other scenarios, I'm sure, that uh, um, or a, a hang on make, make more sense or the climber. Yeah. Um, and actually, I kind of missed my climber this year. I, you didn't uh, use it at all, I did didn't you? use it at all. I had it in the back of the truck and uh, or the back seat, and uh, I never, never had a uh, found a situation that I thought it would work, work better than the uh, saddle did. Yeah. I mean, the saddle is just so much nicer because it's so lightweight. I yeah. mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. I, yeah. Pretty blown away compared to some of the other stands you've <laughs> yeah. carried in and carried those sticks in and everything. So I made it definitely more efficient. And you, yeah, I came back and you had, custom rope mods on your on your what was was there were you had you using hawk heliums or what were you yeah i had the hawk heliums and um i picked up some aiders and then i did the uh am still rope instead instead of the uh strap buckles yeah yeah which that that made it a lot quieter um i think quicker to put up yeah uh the linkable am still i think it was oh yeah yeah yours were yeah yours were the um uh, what do they call those? I'm losing my train of thought, but where they, where they have pre, pre braided, uh, pre braided loops. loops. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, I can't remember the term for it either, but yeah. So you were using those and being able to bounce around and get in and everything. So what, all right, to, to kind of, to move along as we we're talking about relocating this deer, locating this deer, kind of getting down into the, you know, where you ended up having your second in-person encounter. Kind of explain how that came about. All right. Uh, looking ahead at the weather, um, it was killing me a lot of them days not beyond a efficiently ground hunt, still hunt, uh, because of how noisy it was. I mean, I, I had actually uh, one of the days tied a branch to my belt and drug it to try to cover up my steps um, and, you know, tried to do things that would uh, – break up the human being walking through the woods you know you know doing the hill to toe steps but also uh like i said i i tied a branch to a string and just dragging that around for a while <laughs> it didn't help me and I that don't, sounds I don't like that sounds me. like a johnny stewart trick right there oh, you, and him, <laughs> <laughs> you and him always have have these ways that i'm learning as far as covering up sound from walking well it didn't it didn't help me that day it's so uh, I don't know if I'd advise to try it, <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, um, the, on the, the November 12th, looking ahead at the weather, it was going to be a rainy morning and, uh, I think it was a, a decent wind. So I, I think the wind I figured was going to, would be uh pretty consistent. So I decided to, uh, do a still hunt and, uh, and actually at that, at this point in time, I thought that was my best odds of killing him was on the ground. Um, you know, just, um, just from what I had been seeing, um, I, 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 I figured the stands that I was hunting or the trees I was sitting in, I'm, I thought maybe he had me patterned. Mm-hmm. So I'm, at this point in time, I'm thinking my best chance is to get him on off the ground. So I started that morning right at daylight and, uh, I don't know, I was probably only a half hour into the hunt when, um. It was after I did a series of grunts, and uh, I see this big body deer heading my way, and beautiful rack on it. And as he got closer, it was him. And um, he probably came within well, at forty yards. I I could have probably stopped him and and, and shot. It, it was open enough because um, I was on the edge of the clear cut. I wasn't in the clear cut, mm-hmm. and um, he was on the outside edge of it. But it, that, there was that no reason. Hemlocks at that point, right? Yeah, so I was you in could, some uh, a you hemlock could see mix underneath it a little bit. Yeah, better. I was in a hemlock mix, a little bit of beech shrub. I was uh, outside of the clear cut edge, probably about thirty yards off the edge, uh, going through these hemlocks. And the reason I, I I was doing this is I had a one of my cameras on a trail scrape um, outside of the clear cut in these hemlocks, and I had picked him up on that camera uh on on november 8th okay um so i knew that he was using that trail um so instead of being directly in the clear cut that morning i was 
wanted to work them them hemlocks. Um, so I'm, I'm moving through. Well, I, well, I, I, I have them. I have my eyes on them. You know, there was no reason really for me to stop him at 40 and and, and uh, take the shot when it just it was no doubt in my mind he was getting closer, uh, which he did. But he was actually headed downwind of me, trying to get downwind of me. Now, and I'm and and, and normally in a clear cut situation, all the deer that I've grunted in come in on a string. Uh, I've never had one try to go downwind on me. Um, but being that this was a more open than in the clear cut, I'm thinking that's why he. He didn't see, you could probably see a little bit more. And didn't yeah, see or, I mean, well, I guess in hindsight, maybe in the clear cuts, I never see the ones that sort of go downwind to me at that distance. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, that's true. But uh, anyways, uh, he got, uh, you know, right alongside me, and he was probably, I, I guess, maybe even 30 yards, but it was too thick. It was a, There was a hemlock and a, a blowdown that he was behind between me and him. So I immediately uh, started running again. And I uh, went to full draw, and I'm um, figuring he's going to pop out one side or the other. And I could see him in a brush, and now his body is, you know, what I thought was coming straight at me. But here he had turned and went, went straight away from me. And then uh, then he made the turn, and he went the way back the way he came, but he was out about 60 yards at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, he went back or away from me at about the same speed as he was coming in. Um, I, I, he just knew something wasn't right. Maybe he caught a little bit of my scent. I'm, I'm not really sure what happened there, but, uh, um, pretty much the gig was up. So I, um, waited a little bit, grunted some more. And, uh, after probably about 15 minutes, I decided I was going to try to track him in the leaves and, uh, follow the direction he went and maybe try to get another, you know, try to piss him off enough to have another encounter with him. Um, so that's what I did. And I was probably another two, 300 yards from where I had the encounter with, uh, with him. And now I'm in some real thick stuff. And, uh, so it's, um, you know, and now it, you know, this two, 300 yards took me probably, uh, maybe two and a half hours to get that distance. Um, and, uh, maybe a little longer, but I'm just creeping through, grunting once in a while. And at that point in time, you know, I had lost his track within the first 60, 80 yards. So I was just kind of taking some trails and uh, uh, just assuming he went a certain way. But uh, then I heard a real deep grunt and uh, uh, and, a, and a roar. And so and, it, and from the deepness of the grunt, I thought it got to be him. And it he didn't, it, you know, it sounded close, but it was so thick I couldn't see him. I grunted, I roared, I kind of mimicked what he did and uh, did some bleats too and uh, nothing. I did hear some crashing, so I, he was uh, chasing a doe is what I figured. Yeah. So at that point in time, I decided that uh, I need to back out. And uh, I actually went back to the, the truck and got the saddle and uh, decided to... Uh, climb a tree in it, it, that general area where I had my encounter. I figured if there's a, you know, if he, if there is a hot doe in the area that he was chasing, maybe, you know, he was, you know, when I grunted him up, he was, you know, on her trail, who knows. Um, but, uh, I thought, you know, it's kind of my best chance right now is to, you know, just climb a tree and, and, and see what happens. So I got into tree, maybe, uh, it's probably one, one thirty now, I'm guessing, and uh, this that, was November the twelfth, right? Yeah, November twelfth. Okay. And uh, planned on sitting there till dark, and it was probably right around four o'clock. Um, I could hear the uh, telltale sound sound of a bird dog coming through the clear cut. <laughs> um, so, sure enough, pretty soon a dog appears, and then the hunter appears, and. As my luck would have it, they decide to exit the clear cut right where I'm basically at and come into the hemlocks. And uh, they pretty much got right below me. Then I just kind of started getting a little nervous because the dog started uh, acting like it was sending a bird. And the, the hunter was 
like getting ready. I'm thinking if that dog flushes a bird and ends up flying like by you. by me, and he's you know he shoots and doesn't even know I'm there. So I made the hunter aware that I was there, and and he just you know he kind of waved and he called his dog and kind of went back the way they came. Um, so I. I only sat there for probably another half hour, and I decided to get out, and I actually went and checked some cameras um, about a half a mile away to see if there was any, you know, if if stickers had been at any of those other cameras um, or not. Um, so that, you know, that was the end of that day. Uh, didn't have them on any of the other cameras that I checked. I checked, I think, two more that, that right before it got dark, and... Uh, Went in there on Saturday the 13th, did an all-day sit at that stand in that saddle. I had left my sticks there in the platform, so all I had to do was go up and clip on. I even had my, my, my purse at rope around there. Um, did an all-day sit there, uh, didn't do any good, um, no deer at all. And I remember Saturday evening telling, telling your mom that... Uh, I have one more day, which was Sunday, uh, because of my schedule. I, I wasn't going to be able to hunt anymore uh, with heading to Montana and, and with work. I told her, I said, come Monday morning, you're going you're to order a side of beef. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was all in now. I was like, you know, well, I was going back and forth whether I should even, uh, you know, if I should just try a different area, try to get uh, – you know. Yeah, well, you oh, hold on. The n- night before that Saturday night, I called you because I was at the the veterans hunt and I was going to get dinner for the guys for the Spartan Forge veterans hunt. And I called you, I said, "How'd you do?" And, no good, and you you get you were obviously disgusted, and and I was going to try to give you a little more pep talk about you know one more day and hunting them, and you obviously didn't want to hear it, and you just said, "I'm going to hunt them in the morning, and then after that, I'm getting meat." <laughs> like, all right all right that's uh yeah i do like to eat them <laughs> can't I can't eat the horns yeah but they are nice to uh <laughs> to look at but uh so yeah i was uh yeah it was it was a long day that well it's been a long season <laughs> yeah so i, I yeah i i, I I'm gonna give go all in uh well my i mean i i told you morning but my plan was all day mm. But uh, no, I knew it. it was just obvious that it was frustration. Yeah, that was speaking at that point. So I was like, "All right, yeah, he he doesn't need to hear anything more from me at this point. I'll just let him keep going." <laughs> but uh, I get in there on uh, uh, Sunday morning. It was our first Sunday. We're allowed to hunt. Um, so and you went back into that same spot. Yeah, I left the sticks where the platform. bird dog was at, yes. and where yep. you had the encounter with. Yeah, him. where I had an encounter with him on the twelfth, and had hemlocks beets mix on the edge of that clear cut. Yep. Um, and uh, it was well, I got in before light, probably oh, probably a good forty five minutes to an hour before light. I was settled in the stand, and uh, just waiting for it to get light and uh, legal shooting time. And actually, I, I think I waited an additional 10 minutes past legal shooting time because it was a, it was overcast that morning. And uh, in those hemlocks, I don't know if I could have, yeah. you know, one positively identified them, but uh, but seen through my peep. Uh, but when it, once it got light enough to where I felt comfortable, I, I started grunting and uh, bleating occasionally. And it was uh, probably... I'm thinking it was uh what around seven o'clock um a little bit before seven when um and i I hadn't bleated for probably five or ten minutes prior to this, but I heard a real deep grunt, and it was the same grunt I heard on the twelfth when I was you know trying to find him on the ground, and I'm thinking it's gotta be him. It was just so deep, just one grunt, and it was close, but my setup is you know my 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 planned shooting or my openings were only 20, maybe 25 max at the time. That's what, what I, you know, what, what I figured I'd, I was going to be able to make a, a, a good shot at. And I could not see much past that. Um, you know, you could see through some of it, but uh, it was difficult to see much further than that. If anyone's ever been in like a, 
somewhat mature hemlock canopy. It's like if you're on the ground underneath it, you can see quite a ways. Yeah, yeah, on up. the ground I could see and, and you, 80, 90 yards, no yeah, problem. Yeah, and then you get up a little bit, and once it starts hitting some of those limbs, it's tough to tough to see. Yeah. In fact, uh, just backing up a little bit, uh, one of my sits in the saddle at a, a different location, uh, same area, I found uh, uh, what I thought was a decent scrape on this one gas line uh, on the edge of some hemlocks. And the only hemlock or only tree I could get in was a hemlock, and it was about 25 yards from the from the scrape. And after putting my first stick up, I'm hanging the second stick and uh, started climbing, stepping on it to do the third one. When I looked at up at the, where the scrape was, and there was just no way I, I couldn't even see the scrape. I just because of the canopy yeah. overhanging, so I removed that second stick and actually hung the platform from standing on the ground. I was only five; my feet were five feet off the ground, and uh, I ended up grunting in a nice eight point uh, that day. That afternoon it was like one thirty, and uh, he come within six eight yards. He come right to the call. Mm -hmm. stared at the base of my tree never looked up at me and then <laughs> looked around a little bit stood there for a good 30 seconds and then made his way up to the scrape which i had dumped some uh uh, uh buck piss on the scrape and uh, he just started sniffing around there but uh yeah uh, you know you know looking back at my setup that i was in here should i have been could i have been lower and got more visibility i'm not so sure um i just um i thought i had uh I mean, the, well, I was sitting near a scrape. But it's also tough, camera. too, like in, the, in that situation, if you're lower, you also have the ability for them to see you better, too. Right, so yeah, and yes, yes. So anyways, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm four sticks up, but I'm not, my sticks aren't spread out. I didn't, I didn't make use of my aiders. Um, so, um, so I'm probably, what, maybe 14 feet, my platform off the yeah. ground or something like that. But, um. Anyways, after I heard that deep grunt, um, I responded with a couple grunts and uh, just waited, and uh, nothing happened. Uh, probably another 10 minutes go by, and uh, I did another series of grunts, and um, after a few minutes of that, I, I see a big body starting to come to me, and I could just catch glimpses of it. You know, it's I'm estimating 70, 80 yards, uh, catching some glimpses of, glimpses of this deer, and it's looking like a doe. So I'm thinking, okay, that's a good thing. And um, as she, well, she disappears pretty much right away after I seen it into th the thicket. To, um, so I'm waiting for this buck to appear to try to, you know, follow the same path as her. Um, I grunted a few more times. Uh, nothing happened. And probably another five, ten minutes go by. And all of a sudden, that doe busts out of where she was at and cuts across in front of me at about 60 yards running. And uh, uh, what well, was her? And uh, um, no, I didn't see the yearling at that time. But anyways, she busts out across, and then here comes Stickers. I could see him. He wasn't running. He was moving fast, uh, but he was definitely dogging her. So they make their they make their way across me, and in the meantime, I'm grunting, trying to pull him off of her. He wouldn't even hesitate; never looked my way. Nothing. Well, they disappear into the, the thick stuff to my right now of my setup, and the wind's in my face. So the wind's on my side right now. There's no way, and it was it was a pretty good wind that morning, um, to where uh, it wasn't swirling. Um, pretty consistent. Yeah, it was it was a very, very consistent wind. So they disappear in the thick to my right, and I'm kind of looking further to my right. If they came out that way, I should be able to see them. There was a couple little openings that you, I would be able to see, but if they went straight away from me or continued to go straight right, um, they could have went out of you know out of the area without me even knowing it. So I wasn't sure if they were still in the thicket or if they continued on, and I just went just couldn't see them anymore or what was going on. Did some more grunting. Uh, I think I even threw a, a bleed in there, but uh, probably another, I don't know, five, ten minutes goes by as it seems like, and uh, all of a sudden, um, after I just did another series of grunts, here come two deer busting out of that thicket, 
coming towards me and they cross in front of me at about 35 yards and then they're disappearing into the thick stuff but there was one spot that they went through that looked like an opening mm -hmm. and i'm thinking dang if he's behind them which he should be he i think i, I can get an arrow in there so for the next 30 seconds i'm frantically positioning myself in the saddle to be able to pull a shot off if he comes to that opening. Mm -hmm. And as I'm doing this, lo and behold, he's coming. I could see his rack coming. <laughs> and uh, so I'm getting ready, and uh, he stops short of that opening by maybe you know, maybe 10 feet. And I didn't had had not gone to full draw yet. There was no need to. It was thick enough that I, you know, I, and I, I really didn't think – you know, with the saddle, the nice thing is you have the tree between you and the deer most of the time. So um, most of my movement and my body is being concealed by the tree. But, um, well, once he started moving again, I go to full draw. Was that, was that, do I remember right, was that off your weak side? Yeah. So if yeah. anyone's hunting out of a saddle, especially someone new to saddle hunting, the, the weak side shot is the most difficult one to kind of get into. And that was the one you had the most anxiety over, like, practicing for. Oh, yeah. I actually <laughs> lowered my bow poundage from 70 to 66. Yeah. I, I, I tried to get it down around 63 based off, or 65 based off the turns and ended up being at 66. But from practicing, you know, here in the yard with it, um, I could not consistently get 70 pounds back on that weak side. Mm -hmm. So that bothered me, you know, and you would, you know, with, were, were coaching me saying about body positioning and that, and I could pull it off if I got my body positioned the way you described, but the whole time uh, I'm thinking in the heat of the moment, am I going to remember this? Yeah. So I lowered my poundage to where I could, consistently pull back regardless of my body position on that weak side yep yeah so that I, i'd done that prior to the season um so yeah it was my weak side which that yeah that did give me some anxiety and that <laughs> kind of why i was in that 30 second panic mode <laughs> trying to remember how i was going to pull this weak side shot off yeah if i if given the opportunity but mm -hmm. i i got in position and uh you know he started uh, walking again or um, and I went to full draw he hit the opening um, and I had in my mind that I wasn't even going to try stopping him but he was you know he was he wasn't running he was just you know basically walking and um, I settled the pin on him you know it got right by the you know right by his front shoulder I squeezed it off and uh, um, well he you know, take another step, and I seen it pass through what I thought was liver, um, which makes sense, you know, being he was still moving. So right away I'm thinking liver shot, and I had the lighted knock, the, the luminoc knock on, and uh, I could see my arrow sticking in the ground where he was standing. He took off running. I grunt right away, started grunting right away, and uh, to calm him down, um, and... You know, my experience with a liver shot is they usually bed within, you know, 50, 60, 80 yards of your shot and it'll just lay there as long as you don't bump them yeah. until they expire. So, you know, I, I grunted to calm them down and then um, also it's going through my mind like, okay, well, maybe I hit low. Maybe I grazed them instead. Oh well, yeah, you're. Well, you, I think you called me like whispering because I was packing my truck for West. No, I, I didn't call you until I checked the arrow three hours. Okay, later. you're texting me then. Yeah, and I'm literally packing my truck to go to West Virginia, yeah. like within like a half hour or so, and and you text me and say I just shot stickers, and I'm like, no way, like you know what, what's going on? And you're like, it felt good, my shot broke good, like everything felt good, and then as the time you're sitting there doubt starts creeping in oh, and then yeah. you text me you're like well maybe i didn't even hit him maybe <laughs> i misjudged the yardage you know and, and he, you said you saw him like kind of kick up over like 
kick his back legs up, and I'm like, that's good. That's double long, and you're like, Yeah, but well, there was a log there. Yeah, you're like, there's a log there, <laughs> and maybe he was just jumping over that log. And you're, and you're, you know, you're getting, and I know what it's like. It's easier for me from the outside looking in to think more clearly about it, and I was just like, you don't know anything until you, until you get down, but obviously you didn't want to get down and spook him because if if it was you know a liver shot and he bedded close or whatever yeah but okay now explain what kind of what happened there from all right so i i i you know i i, I continued to grunt uh and uh probably you know i'm gonna say it's 10 minutes might have been five minutes after the shot all of a sudden i can see a big body coming towards me i'm thinking all right, did I miss? Is he coming in and grunt? And I'm going to get another opportunity here. This is great. Well, it's the it's the big doe. Um, she, so she breaks out of the thicket and like right alongside me. She stops uh, eight yards, ten yards from my stand, right to my left of me. Mm. And then I see some more movement. Well, here comes a yearling, and then some more movement. And here comes there was two yearlings with her. All three doe are right off to my left at eight ten yards. So now I'm thinking, okay, if I did miss or if he doesn't even know he's hit, he should still be on their track or their trail. I mean, if she's hot, he's going to, he's going to be on her trail, her trail. So I'm just, I'm knocked and ready. I'm just waiting and waiting. And, uh, you know, it seemed like an eternity and, uh, I don't know, maybe another five, 10 minutes, they start drifting off behind me, up, up behind me and they start getting nervous because now they're getting downwind of me. They never blew, uh, but uh, the mom started just, you know, going back and forth, knew something was right. And uh, so then I'm thinking, well, I have nothing to lose now. So I just started grunting aggressively and uh, thinking, you know, if I did miss or if he doesn't know he's hit, that maybe he would come that way. And, uh, well, they left and nothing showed up. So I'm thinking, well, that's probably a good sign. <laughs> that uh, he's definitely down. But uh, uh, the other thing was I didn't hear him crash after the shot. You know, usually when you when it's a, a lethal shot, you'll hear him crash with it, you know, within, you know, this 60, 80 yards. Yeah. But I did not hear that. Uh, so that had me concerned. But in the meantime, I'm texting you now and explaining to you that I, I you know, my, my, I, I seen the Luminoc go through his, liver um i'm back more than i want to be um i got to give him time and uh i think you said something about well did you check your arrow and i, and I said no i don't i don't even want to go up to it because you know he may catch my movement and i may jump him out of his bed if he's bedded out of sight so my plan was to sit you know give him six eight hours um or as long as i can i think i told you i wasn't going to come out of the tree till three but uh, then I think you reminded me there was snow moving in. Yeah. Around one thirty, two o'clock, there was, and it was going to be a one to two inch snowfall. So it's like okay. So, and I think it was probably around nine a.m. I finally dug my binos out of my pack and decided to look at the arrow through the binos to see if I could see any blood on it. But at thirty five yards, which it ended up being what the shot was. Um, I probably wouldn't see anything on it anyways. Well, as I'm glassing the arrow, the log's right below it, and it's covered with hair. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> it's covered with a lot of hair, which maybe because of leaves, you just don't pick it out on other shots. i never seen... The only time I've seen that much hair is when I grazed one before. And now my mind's playing tricks on me, and it's looking like white hair through the binos. Yep. So I text you and says, "Well, I think I I grazed them. I got to get down and check my arrow to know for sure because I don't want to be sitting here all day and passing up a decent buck because I'm thinking I have him and he's not even not even, not even bleeding. Yeah, <laughs> not even hurt. <laughs> so I get down as quiet as I can and uh, I actually headed completely opposite direction for about eighty ninety yards of the way he ran." before I cut over the 30 yards, 35 yards, and then headed back to the arrow um, to try to minimize my movement that he would see if he was bedded out there. Mm -hmm. Well, as I creep up to the arrow, and all this takes probably, you know, this this probably took me another 20, 
minutes to do that, maybe in a half hour to, to make that little loop. Mm -hmm. Finally, I get up to my arrow and I could see the blood on it. It was just saturated with blood. And then I look at the hair on the log and it's all gray and brown hair. It's like, okay, this is a good thing. So yeah. I, I got my, well, I took a photo of the arrow, sent it to you, pulled the arrow, thought, well, I'm just going to head to the truck now that I'm out of the tree. You know, my, my, I've already made the movement. I seen some blood within a couple feet. I didn't even step over the, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I just reached out as, uh, where I could pull the arrow and I didn't go any further than that. I kind of looked out ahead. I couldn't see him, but I could only see about 30, 40 yards at most anyways. So I back out, make my way back to the truck, meet you at the house. We're looking the arrow over. Well, then I make a mistake of bringing it up on the internet, the blood on the arrow, remember? Mm -hmm. And it says it's either liver or uh, or uh, muscle. <laughs> yeah. So now it's you, that roller coaster starts again. Um, so finally, well, we decide we're, we're treating it like a liver shot, and uh, we decide that we're going to try to give it as much time as we can, but we got to beat the snow. Uh, so we're watching radar. And I think we end up leaving here around 11.30 to head back out and planned on sitting in a truck for a while, as long as we could, before we headed in, um, you know, beating the snow, basically. So I think it was, what, maybe around 12.30, it, uh, Flurry started up. Yeah. We decided that we yeah, we're like, we better in. Yeah, we better go in at yeah, that point. Yeah, we better move, watching the radar. So we get to the, the shot site, and... Uh, we find blood right away, but it's not much. And um, it wasn't much blood at all for the first 80 yards. No. Um, it wasn't like we weren't, we were having difficulty finding it, but it wasn't a lot of blood. You know, you know, you'd, you'd find uh, on a, say, a maple leaf, only about a third of the leaf had blood on it. And uh, then you'd take a couple more steps and maybe see that again. And it was the dark red blood uh, indicating liver. So we're just creeping along just in case he's still alive and uh, following this trail. And we were, like I said, about 80 yards from the shot site when we came across the, the blood spot. It wasn't much bigger, but it was bubbly blood. It, it, it was Completely bubbles. It was a leaf that was in almost like a cup shape, and it was filled with bubbly blood. Mm -hmm. And it looked, at that point, it looked real good. And uh, Yeah, well, well, we looked at each other and both shook our heads like yeah this is this is a real good thing yeah and uh only went what another 10 yards and then i seen them laying up there and yeah he was expired and here and um he actually was courting slight slightly away from me it entered the liver area but went through both lungs and came out right behind his front shoulder yeah and being uh the angle of the shot um I mean, it, well, you know, we got up there, there was a, you know, all the, the blood had, uh, was like a foamy blood hanging off his side, like a foamy mass that wasn't making it to the ground for whatever. Yeah. Reason. It was almost like gelled up or something. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, we, uh, well, which when, when I, when I, when I dressed him, he was full of blood, he bled inside and, uh, you know, it was probably mid body. And the exit wound was just a hair lower than that, so he, he may, mainly bled inside. Mm -hmm. But he was dead within minutes after the shot. Yeah, yeah, he did. So he, I know, but it was it was in in the dark red blood that we found on the arrow. We'd kind of concluded that that was just because you waited so long to get down that yeah. that blood had dried and just looked yeah. darker. Yeah, it was actually starting to flake off the arrow. Too. Yeah, so it looked darker than it actually was at that point. So. But yeah, he was stiff as a board when we got yeah when we got up to him there. But it was cold and snow, and you know by the time we were taking photos and doing all that kind of stuff, it was starting to snow pretty good. Yeah, we were we, we yeah we had a good we had a good coating of snow. Well, yeah, we drug him out in the snow. Yeah, we did. Um, but uh, no, I think we I, you know in hindsight, would I do it, done anything differently? Probably not, based on the information I had. Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, you know my first. Um, I guess in, you know information was it went through the liver. Yeah. Um, 
you know, all those second, third, fourth guesses I did uh, was just painful. Well, yeah, but, you, but it didn't really hurt anything because we knew it was cold. Oh, yeah. And no, it everything else, anything. it didn't. It didn't hurt anything to wait, and you know when you have the opportunity to wait, it's probably better than no. It just hurt my rushing. nerves, is all. Yeah, <laughs> and yours. Yeah, no, it definitely, <laughs> definitely did. But that when, you walk, when you walked up and saw that deer, it was oh man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I've never, I never thought I'd ever get to experience that moment. Yeah. Um, and I think I think the first words that I said to you is this doesn't happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh it was an unbelievable sight and uh you know, I've been on a lot of journeys targeting a sp- specific buck that never pans out. A few of them have, but uh more often than not yeah. it doesn't doesn't end this way. No. Um and I was prepared to, to eat my tag, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it all worked out in the end without a doubt. And yeah. And, 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 and definitely without, you know, people like you and your mom behind me, encouraging me to hold out reinforcing, you know, what my goal is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would have, uh, held out as long as I did. Well, I think th- you need them people behind you to, to, you know, to keep, keep keep the reality in it i guess well as as, uh as we were saying there was no doubt that yeah yeah you didn't that uh you'd be able to do it it was just whether you were able to control yourself with it (laughs) and shoot something earlier and then and i and i had to frame it to you because i i realized i was being super blunt the one time that i I said something i had apologized because it could have came off the wrong way (laughs) and uh, i was like it did i i I, I didn't mean it that way but i said you shot something about you shot a lot of really good deer now it's your time to get your you know your your mega giant all that and uh, it's something along those lines maybe i worded it even more crude but it was it was meant to say that like you shot a lot of really good deer. Now it's this is your ch- chance. You have this deer dialed to shoot your once in a lifetime type buck, you know. And well, it, I'd, I'd I'd been just happy going to the next level. Yeah, not not Jumping to the top up. level. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I skipped a couple of levels in there. Yeah, but it. Yeah, and I mean, the deers. You know, we're looking at them right now. It's kind of staring at them. But I mean, he had. 15 scorable points 15 scorable and there's 20 that you can hang a ring on yeah so it was it was crazy and what you'd found that balloon oh yeah tell, yeah. tell the story about yeah, that yeah one of my uh scouting steel hunts i uh came across a uh a balloon which i always pick them up um but uh this one had uh an 18 on it uh, and uh uh, instead of throwing that one away when I got home, I actually put it on the uh, register here in the basement to dry out and showed showed Rhonda. I said, look at this. I says, when I shoot stickers, he's going to have 18 scorable points. Well, he had 15. <laughs> but, uh, he had 18 points, but well, 15 t- scorable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's funny. It's crazy. And, and yeah, so I... Uh, I obviously that day I didn't go to West Virginia and it was time to go back to camp and we had our celebratory uh, fireball shots that you somehow always have a bottle in your pack and a couple shot glasses. Yeah, we did. We had that, uh, yeah, we, even before we field dressed. Yeah. <laughs> and we had another one in the truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good and good night at camp. Everyone got to show up. There was a ton of people, I think, that filtered in and out of there that night. Yeah ton of people yeah. came came uh well even the the spartan forge uh brought the whole lodge down yeah the the guys from the veterans hunt and everything veterans came hunt. and bill and and johnny leading the leading the pack as normal showing yeah, up yeah those are a bunch of good guys there yeah no it was, on that veteran hunt yeah it was it was good to to get everybody there and and checking it out and seeing it and yeah, definitely the end of a story. And what you had figured, what is you, you, you're going to possibly probably send the teeth out, but you're thinking he's at least seven and a half, maybe eight and a half, based off of your photos. Yeah, and you had a whole uh, sheet printed out of him from every year from 2016 to 2021, except for you missed. Yeah, one there was only year. one year I didn't film, and that was 2018, and I had camera troubles. 
Um, and I remember, you know, that, that's, that place where I'd pick them up in the summer, I think that camera was down for probably a good month, month and a half, where I didn't have a camera mm-hmm. operating there. Um, so was, you know, I, just, I think I just missed him that year. Uh, but, uh, or maybe he just didn't come through, but yeah, he's, uh, I don't know if I'll ever top this and I really don't care if I do, to be honest with you. <laughs> what, what, what would you think what would be the biggest learning lessons from this deer that this deer has taught you that maybe you'd be able to apply going forward or anything else? Well, I think the, well, the biggest thing is you got to pass on some of the ones you normally would shoot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I don't know if, if I could do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, um, no, you definitely, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, um, I mean, just got to constantly or, uh, you know, never give up. You know, how many years I've been hunting them and I didn't give up. I just couldn't find them. Yeah. I mean, I would, you know, those years I didn't find them, I'd still be checking cameras on Sunday, still throwing, moving cameras, uh, uh, trying to find them, but I could never find them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in hindsight, his range was a lot smaller than I anticipated. Um, You know, there's some bucks that you pick up, you know, you'll pick up on one scrape and then a scrape two miles away, you pick them up, you know, a day or two later or even maybe that same night um, where this guy... You know, he didn't come outside of that area once I found him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even during the rut. I mean, no, yeah, that's right. Yeah, which there was a good, you know, there's a decent amount of dough there that I think helped keep him there. But, you know, I, you know, I, I just think that, you know, maybe he was to the age where he just didn't want to travel much. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a, you know, I, you know, my thoughts, I guess, on that whole line is, you know, these younger bucks. For one, the dominant buck is pushing them out of the area if they come through. Uh, but you know, but for two, I mean, they're they're eager, they're looking, they're searching, and they they will travel. I mean, that's. Uh, but I think with the older they get, uh, you know, they kind of slow down like a human being does. You know, you just, you just don't want to go as far. And um, plus, you know, if he becomes the, you know, the king in that area and he has all the does that are his, well, why would he want to leave? Yeah. No, that makes that makes sense. And I mean, really, I mean, you talked about a couple of bucks you'd pass and stuff, but when you were hunting them specifically, you didn't see even in your cameras not a whole lot of other bucks. No, no, there wasn't a whole lot other, you know, different ones that uh, were in that area. Um, on the outskirts, I was picking up some different bucks. Yeah, um, like that nice ten and those couple other ones, but that was a half a mile from, you know, this five hundred yard clear cut. I guess. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, yeah, I, but right in that core area, his core area, um, I just had that one small, well, not small, but, uh, decent eight or 10. Well, I, I, had, I actually had both of them on camera, uh, a wide, low, low, uh, tine eight and a wide, low tine 10. Uh, I'm not sure. I couldn't tell from the video. It wasn't real clear if it was the eight or the 10, but. Um, those are the uh, probably the only other two that were in that core area that I hadn't seen or filmed. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, pretty amazing. Where so where do you, where do you go from there? Well, actually, today you were already out trying to find his sheds again from last yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I've shed hunted this area. I've had I've shed hunted this exact clear cut um, for the last. You know, I don't know how many years, even before I knew he was around, I, I would shed hunt this clear cut. Um, but based off what I thought I have learned, I'm, I'm thinking I can find his sheds from last year or maybe even the year before. You know, I don't know if this is the biggest he's been. Last year, I had I filmed him in, what was it, June? Yeah, you didn't get him much later. June 29th was the last I had him, and he was probably 140 to 150 at that time and you know had another month and a half of growing yeah so i don't know what he turned into last year he could have been bigger i like to think this is i got him at his 
I feel like up. you. I feel like you got him based off those summer photos. I feel like you got him at his peak. I mean, yeah, I mean, regardless, it doesn't matter. But yeah, uh, I would like to try to find them sheds or even some prior years. The only thing is, there was a lot of beach not in this area this year, uh, and there was a lot of squirrels. Squirrels will do mm. gnaw down an antler in a short period of time. So I don't know if there's going to be anything left if 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 they are still laying there. I got to believe that, you know, maybe, well, I guess somebody else could have picked them up. But being I didn't have the hunting pressure, I'm not so sure if, you know, anybody else really knew. Yeah. Or maybe they were like me other years and just didn't find them yet. They might have been half a mile away and I, you know, looking for them. And like I had been the other prior years or a yeah. couple miles away. But who knows? I guess it's weird. Normally with a, a deer of this caliber, no matter where it's at, someone's had, you know, some sort of history with yeah. them or anything and seemed to be pretty, pretty quiet. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. That was a good thing. You're right. <laughs> but yeah. So now I get to, I get to find another one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a, there's a couple up and comers, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. See if they make it through the rifle season here. We got to let another weekly left. Yeah, we do. Yeah, another another week for them to try to try to survive through it. And I know a couple of my other target bucks did get harvested this archery season and rifle season. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Um, so it, my list is dwindling. Yeah, uh, there's a couple still left, there, but there's there's there'll be some to replace it in the future. But yeah, awesome. And then. And we won't go into the the story really of it now for time's sakes here, but yeah, you went out to Montana and shot a big muley. Then yeah, what a week later, not even a week later. Yeah, I left or a the, little week, a little over well, week later. I, I left on that Thursday. Uh, we drove out, and then it was that following Wednesdays when I harvested uh, my mule deer. Yeah, big four by four. Yep. Real big one for that area in yeah, Montana. For, for public land Montana. Um yeah, it was I I would I would say that's uh definitely yep. one of the bigger bigger ones for that, that area. Yeah, we put a pressure what, right around hundred and fifty inches on Yeah, a little, a little over one fifty. Yeah, a little over one fifty and then your white tail we didn't mention it, but he was one seventy on the dot. One seventy zero eight zero eight so we got it written down here, which is incredible. Yeah, that's just total antler, no deductions. Yeah, yep, gross score, which is pretty incredible. And the fact that he's not very wide. <laughs> no, 16 and, and a quarter inside. Yeah, so he's not very wide, didn't have a lot of, you know, uh, from that standpoint, he's just so big in every other Well, he aspect. carried the mass. I mean, I think I got around 39 inches just in mass measurement, where yeah. normally you're in the low th 30s probably on an average at least my average deer yeah. passed. Uh, so, that, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever top this, and I really don't care if I do. I just still, yeah, I'm, right. still, I'm until, still, in, still in disbelief. Yeah, until until you find the sheds of another one this spring. It's oh, like, yeah. Uh, here we go again. <laughs> I won't say I won't try, but. <laughs> yeah. This one definitely tested uh, my patience and my willpower and everything else. Yeah, well, over over three weeks straight of almost every single day hunting them. Yeah, well, uh, some were just evenings, um, but yeah, I had. I mean, even the Sundays you, I couldn't hunt. I was out scouting. Actually, those were all dark to dark scouting trips. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I was I was hunting them whether I had a bow in hand or not for. Yeah, from that 23rd on when I finally got him hard-horned. Yeah. That was where, you know, most of my efforts were directed. Yep. Yeah, your priorities shifted there pretty quickly at that yeah. point once you found him again. Yep. Well, thanks for sharing the story there with us. And, yeah, I'll be staring at this rack for a while and hopefully going to do something good with it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me on. I right. hope hopefully I can help somebody else out. But uh Yeah. Well next now we're now we're starting scouting for next year already. So oh, yeah. Or, oh yeah, that's already started, so never uh, never it never ends. No. <laughs> Alrighty. All right, thank you. Yep. 
Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.